Hi, everybody, and welcome to another exciting edition of Words, Images, and Worlds. I'm delighted to be joined on this episode by legend. Can I say legend? I don't use the word legend always, uh, but I will say legend Mort Todd. Uh, may I call you Mort, Mr. Todd? What What would you prefer? Just don't call me late for dinner, but not uh, Mort. It's fine, of course. And legend <laughs> usually means old. Well, I don't know. I don't know. I, I think... <laughs> I think impressive work. I'll I'll, oh, I'll go with you. that definition. Yeah, yeah. And I, yeah. I I want to tell your audience. I I warned Jason earlier that I, I got a bit of a disclaimer that uh, I got into a small car accident and lost a bunch of teeth, so I look like a jack o' lantern or something. So it's only temporary, but just wanted people to know I'm I don't always look this freakish. Not always. Well, well usually glad- perfect. Glad you're okay from the accident. And I, I, on the other hand, always do look like this, which is uh, <laughs> something that I apologize for. Black ears. Yeah, it's amazing. The, this developed when I was young. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or I just carry around the headphones as like a comfort object uh, to drown out some of the noise in the world. Um, so folks out there probably know you through a little book called Cracked. There was Cracked as well as Marvel music. And then you, you've done really amazing work. That's sort of the humor, the the entertainment and the pop culture side. But then you've also done some really amazing work in comics horror with EC oriented things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a um, lot of the same creators that were at EC and Warren. and uh, Yeah, and it, it's just such a... It's a cool time to read. It's and the way those books work with kind of the short little stories. My my favorite one of yours is the one with the golem. Uh, yeah, in it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, they're they're sort of bite sized stories, but the they carry a lot of bite, and it's fun to see that style. Thanks, appreciate it. Yeah, because it was obviously a labor of love growing up reading creepy and eerie, and then the EC reprints and stuff. So I was working with a lot of the artists already that had worked for those magazines. So I was like say let's put on a monster party yeah yeah uh and love that and um i can't remember the first time i found cracked but i was one of those kids that that read comics and comics lampoon things um so really really enjoy the the humor side as well um so you were you were a reader of the ec stuff as a younger person oh, yeah. is that true everything yeah. anything i get my hands on you know religious comics you know promotional comics anything (laughs) yeah and it's cool what people do in comics i've seen like a a story of jonah in comics like jonah in the well uh, and enjoy seeing the collaboration that people bring onto the page Mm -hmm. uh, and and the way the stories work any any collaborators that you've worked with over the years that you want to shout out as being particularly positive productive uh interactions Uh, like from the very beginning at cracked working with like uh john severin and steve ditko and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. just a bunch of these guys who were you know been in comics for decades and i grew up loving their stuff and i was like a little kid in the candy shop because i could call them up say do you want to draw a short funny story yeah <laughs> but you know i would uh, severin lived in denver and i'd be on the phone to him hours per week and everything which was pretty educational i also got to ask him you know about the ec days and you know timely and atlas in the 40s and 50s when he worked in the bullpen and the same with ditko he he lived like two blocks away from our offices so he would just drop in anytime and hang out and i'd drop whatever i was doing and we just talk for hours about all kinds of stuff like like comics but also movies when steve ditko drops by you you drop what you're doing I figure, right? What could be so important? You know, deadlines for suckers. I could do it tomorrow, you know. <laughs> and uh, I just got invited. They have an annual Ditko like festival in his hometown in Johnston, Pennsylvania. And so I'll be going to that in September. Oh, nice, nice. I always like to ask about upcoming events and yeah. and things of that I haven't nature. been doing any for, for a while, but I really wanted to, I couldn't make it last year, but I'm definitely going to go this year. And I'm going to premiere a short video I did uh, interviewing artist Frank McLaughlin on Steve. Because uh, right after Steve passed away, Frank, who was 
like the Charlton art director and also, uh, you know, like Dick Giordano's assistant and inked most of everything that Giordano did. But he called me because he was uh, like, you know, all these obituaries about Steve, you know, they paint him as like a, a weirdo hermit and everything. And I want to mm. set the story straight. And so it's like, cool. Yeah. So I recorded him for about two hours, but I whittled it down to about 20 minutes for Ditko centric piece. <laughs> oh yeah 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 it's good to correct that story and share about your talks with him and life with him yeah he, he's a super nice generous guy he just didn't suffer fools you know <laughs> <laughs> i know so many stories of people i knew and other you know fans would go to his door and like are you steve ditko be slam you know because he's he's got a draw yeah, but even at a convention, I, I try to even when the when people are there for that, I try to be thoughtful. And if people are in the middle of drawing something, you know, sometimes I'll just stand there and watch, and, and just enjoy and kind of go, okay, this this is a good moment to see this yeah, person definitely. do their thing. Yeah. Uh, and now I have to ask, um, are you in fact Spider Man? There's a Spider Man costume hanging behind oh, you. I'm outed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's an artifact I picked up at Marvel. Oh, came, nice. my, came back from a long liquid lunch once to my office, and sitting in front of it was a box of Spider Man outfits, like dozens for like public appearances and stuff. And I was like, I think I need this. You oh, know? yeah. No, nobody's <laughs> going nobody's to miss that. Nobody. <laughs> I know. <laughs> So I, I, I admit it, I committed a crime at Marvel, but I think the statute of limitations has passed. I think so. I think so. And that's uh, more than I'm, I'm sure they owe you much more than that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. and so it you're... wasn't like I was walking out with piles of artwork like like some past employees might have allegedly done. <laughs> we won't name names. Um <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, so you you've done a lot in sort of bringing work from the past. You've done a lot in bringing uh, music to comics, which I also appreciate. Uh, uh, you mentioned someone at the top of the episode before we started recording who learned reading in English through comics. Of all, that would be one Gene Simmons of Kiss. Yes. Yeah. Um, we we did a book with him and. They are characters, I'll tell you. Oh, I bet. I bet. I basically worked with Gene and Paul and, uh, you know, got to go to shows. That was a cool thing at Marvel Music is I worked closely with every band uh, and often went on tour with them or in the studio and stuff like that. So we could have uh, figure out what the best kind of story would be for them because some were, you know, like biographies like Bob Marley, you know, and then you have like, uh, you know, Kiss fighting the X-Men. And then, uh -huh. <laughs> you know, so you talk to every musical artist and go like, what do you want to do? And there's always one token comic book geek in the band, at least one. And yes. Like, yeah. Good. We're going to do a Marvel comic. <laughs> very cool. So, very cool. Yeah. Any really positive interactions there with uh, the world of music, which is a world I really know nothing about. Yeah. No, it was just really fun. I mean, unlike a lot of people in comics, I've worked in music a lot. I started out as a kid doing record covers and just knew a lot of bands personally and in New York City and everything. So, uh, you know, I think it was a good uh, symbiosis with the comics and music and everything. So it's it's a shame. It really didn't get the distribution that was promised or deserved. So. I mean, I was like, how else could you get Neil Gaiman to go to Marvel like back then? You know, we had him do Alice Cooper book and everything. So it's like, yeah, you know, there was sure. a lot of potential there that hadn't hasn't yet been fulfilled, but still could be. <laughs> and there were those cool action figures of of the Kiss band that came out too that were like comics inspired. Like, what yeah. if they're musical accoutrement was actually some kind of, kind of intergalactic battle weapon so i love the love the, it's just fun just fun yeah. stuff you you seem exactly. to be a purveyor of really fun stuff and a creator of fun stuff well i thank you i try i i basically you know i try to have fun and i try to create material that i'd like to see and hopefully a lot of other people would do 
that's the that's the secret ingredient right there um so any out of all that you've done is there anything that you hold up and you go this is it this is what i am most proud of this is the thing that i would want everyone to read first of mine uh well create creatively probably the monsters attack books because i really put a lot of work into them and a lot of you know a lot of blood and sweat and and i think they turned out great but on like a professional level uh i think you know like getting don martin away from mad magazine after like 30 years and Mm -hmm. so that he and other artists would own their material get their artwork returned get paid for reprints and you know stuff you'd kind of take for granted now but wasn't the standard back then and um, you know and i like i said i really enjoyed working with older artists and also cultivating new artists but like we had three legally blind artists working for me you know and that that's the only way they could make a living you know so it's like otherwise they'd be screwed and that that was like uh don martin who had you know eye surgery for decades like even in the frankenstein era when they would sew a new cornea onto your eye and everything mm, by then gene coleman was legally blind and and Bill Ward, if you know his work. Yeah, yeah. And I was going to mention Gene Colan on the the Monsters books, too. Great to see Yeah, that. he did some humor, too, and it, it's great. Like, a lot of these artists, you know, like to be able to stretch their artistic endeavors as opposed to, you know, just drawing people punching each other every month, you know. They can right. draw something goofy, you know. And a lot of times, too, I, I ask the artist, what do you feel like drawing? You know, because if it's something they're into you they're going to give you their best so it's like well i'm kind of into motorcycles so we do a crack look at motorcycles you know or something like that. yeah <laughs> or like uh, with maurice, that. yeah like with marie severin that was just it too we was like what do you feel like drawing she's like oh i want to do the golden girls and murder she wrote so it's like sounds good to me <laughs> nice nice yeah yeah and, and great to follow the artist and wherever the muse sort of goes and have that creative freedom too yeah. which is i imagine not something you get very often uh in comics yeah and, and i kind of uh, thought it was sort of like advertising work for like with actors because it was a short gig you know it'd be like four to eight pages black and white they get paid two or three times what they got at marvel or dc per page so you know it was just attractive to them on different levels like with ditko Every job he did, he would do it. It was black and white, but he'd do it in a different medium, like with wash or uh, do a shade or, you know, he'd always be trying something different. Like you said, constantly stretching yourself, genre, style. Yep. Yeah, because I obviously grew up always loving superheroes and stuff, but I do like the other genres. And, you know, by the time I was a teenager up in Maine, you could still find like uh, pre-code books for like 50 cents, you know? So I got tons of horror and crime and all this stuff. And so uh, that kind of inspired me more. And once I get into the business, I figure, you know, there's enough people doing superheroes. I want to try and do something else that might appeal to people outside of the superhero world, you know? It seems like, it seems like it's a good spot right now, at least from the outside looking in of like, uh, comics and what's possible because I mean EC did romance you had western comics you had uh, horror humor all of these things and then they sort of went away for a while and now now I think right. people are hopefully getting tuned in back into some of those things yeah well I think a major part of it too is distribution and that's like a top secret project I'm working on right now is to get comics back everywhere yeah. and if we you know get them into all the stores and everything then it won't be just superheroes because you want to appeal to regular people, well, regular people, and, uh, you know, have like Western and romance and horror and stuff like that. So if you yeah. see what I've been putting out for like the last eight years, it's mostly like Charlton related, Charlton comics related, but uh, it's all genres, you know, I try and do, you know, we, we got uh, two romance books by Paul Kupperberg that, that are pretty, pretty nutty. And mm-hmm. uh, yeah just every everything possible I, in yeah. fact we did a western uh and and i sent a copy to steve ditko and he goes hmm it's really a horror western isn't it 
because almost every story was pretty twisted. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> I hadn't noticed it putting it together, but I was like, yeah, he's right. You know, I had aliens and werewolves. Not in every story, but you know, enough. A nice genre bending there. Yeah. Well, that's just it. I love mixing the genres and and Charlton would do that a lot too, with like hot rod nurses or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so uh you mentioned you have a Ditko event in September. You have top secret projects. Uh, anything that you want to tip off as someone who continues to advocate for the medium spaces people can go to online or uh, books or projects to look for? Sure. I've, I've got the very humbly named mortodd.com. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and you can see all my books available there that, you know, they're, they're available at Amazon and, you know, Kablam, a bunch of other places. And uh, I've been working on a project for many years now, which is some of the most fun I'm ever having. And it's for an outfit in California called Mystery Island. And nice. uh, they, they, the writer, Brad Hamlin, came up with hundreds of characters. And he started them as pulp characters. So uh, we're, gonna, we're, we're doing a 12-issue series uh, where it's like an old pulp magazine where like, you know, every three or four pages I do an illustration, a very lurid illustration, I might add, to go mm -hmm. with the story and stuff. So it's it's just really fun. That's all I can say because, you know, too many times working with the majors as a freelancer, like, I don't like this. And it was like, what do you want me to change? Like, I don't know. I just don't like it, you know? And, I was like, mm -hmm. and as an editor <laughs> myself, if I ever have a problem with something, I'll show them you know it, it, right. and usually nothing's that bad you know that you can't just print it but uh you know if there was ever anything I'd, I'd say it but with brad it's just you know I'll, I'll i'll be doing a drawing and go like mm, i don't know how he'll react to this and everything and i send it to him he's like that was the freaking fantastic and i was like Ooh. good feedback that's, good another, that's another thing uh being an editor uh with freelancers is I'd get a job and I'd be like, whoa, and call him up and go like, this is excellent. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and a lot of times too, like if Dicko was in the office, we'd get a new Severin job in and he would literally pour over the page and use his finger to like look at the detail and everything. He was just like floored by it. It's good to see, uh, you know, artists enjoying other people's work because uh, more recent generations are more, uh, have more of a rivalry, it seems, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah yeah and i i imagine connecting it back to music yeah you know, i might look at a page and see something but when you're the person who knows those notes to to sort of look from that professional right. lens you you see things that other people don't yeah and that's another thing working in with music and comics is there's so many similarities because you know people will get into comics and get into rock you know mm -hmm. they might think they're going to make a million but they get into it because they love medium and stuff, you know, so you have a lot of uh, similar things and the same with like, you know, the way they distributed stuff, the copyrights, all that. It was all pretty similar. <laughs> uh oh, can't hear you. Oh, oh I said absolutely. Oh, I was just agreeing. Oh. Just agree. <laughs> yeah. Thought the schnauzer got your tongue. Nope, nope. Schnauzers are, they're all settled yeah. in. They're all downstairs and just hanging out. So, um, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for taking some time to talk with me and, and talk about things. I was thinking about the, um, the Beatles. Have you seen the Beatles like three hour special that was on mm -hmm. Disney? So there's the scene where, um, John Lennon is recording and he's kind of playing with the song. And the way that he talks about the music, he, I mean, he starts, you know, in that very John Lennon sort of, I'm not going to do that. But he, he uh, would talk about like the construction of the song as like musical notes. And it was almost like his own language. And uh, yeah. we were talking before the recording too about uh, comics as a second language. And they definitely, <laughs> they have their, their own particular language. So lots there yeah. to appreciate. There's a great photo of Ringo reading a Charlton comic, Unexplored Worlds. I see. Find, nice. there's, I got a collection of just stuff I pulled off the internet of just tons of rock bands reading comics through the decades and junk. Because, like, when you're torn, what else are you going to do? 
seem like the monkeys like DC more. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Even though they had a Dell comic and not a DC comic. There it is. There it is. All the connections. <laughs> Uh, well, a pleasure to meet the the real life Spider Man. Uh, I'm gathering. Oh yeah, gotta yeah. remember to put that away. <laughs> and, and such a such a good opportunity to talk with you. Thank you for saying yes and jumping on. Oh, Did I miss you. anything that you want to make sure to share out? I think that covers my whole life in like 20 minutes. Right? Yep, there it is. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. Well, again, thank you for asking me and uh, look You're forward welcome. to seeing you. My, my pleasure. Great to talk to you and uh, great to share this out and encourage people to to travel through comics and music and do some exploring if they haven't. And go to morttodd.com. That's right. Morttodd.com. <laughs> Always hyping. That's right. Thank you so much. You bet. Take care.